I want to start with some questions of what patient-centered care is, what prevents patient-centered care from being practiced, and then how can the IMAGINE project, which is why we're here today, move healthcare in Alberta toward becoming more patient-centered? So let me begin with a clarification involving who means what when people speak of care being patient-centered or as some people prefer to say, family-centered. For patients and their families, what's involved in this phrase is, I think, the patient in the singular. Healthcare is patient-centered when it recognizes the particular needs of specific people, and when it's willing to adapt institutional procedures, protocols, to fit those individual needs. Over many years, a story has stuck with me. It's a parallel exactly to the story that Dave told about his emergency room experience with Greg. This was a story of some friends of ours years ago uh, whose child needed surgery at the old children's hospital. And our friend has told this story herself publicly in rounds, so it betrays no confidences to tell it again today. In accordance with good patient-centered practice, the child was assured that her mother could go with her right into the emergency room and stay with her, holding her hand, until she went to sleep. Children, of course, take such assurances very seriously. Children are learning about trust. That was the patient-centered ideal. When the child was actually being taken into the operating room, the surgeon told the child's mother that she could not go with her daughter, the simple reason being that it slowed down his schedule to have parents coming into the operating room. The schedule trumped individual needs that the surgeon understood perfectly well. Here we get to what it means too often to healthcare workers to be patient-centered. Now the most serious, if perhaps overly generous, rationale I can concoct for that surgeon's behavior reflects something that was said to me again years ago at an annual retreat of a specialized medical unit that I was invited to attend. The unit administrator was acknowledging that the pace of their examinations and assessment routines were, and I think I remember her word correctly, painful to their patients. But then she said something that has stuck with me, obviously, all these years. She added, we have patients who die on our waiting list. The reality of the waiting list who else needs care while I'm spending time with this patient is part of how healthcare workers need to live. It weighs on them. For professionals then, being patient-centered means that the singular patient is known and served within an aggregate of patients. Here we get to what may be, in my observation, the most significant, oh, actually, we can switch to this mic, and I don't need this one. Uh, what may be the, the most serious disconnection between patients and their families on one side and healthcare workers on the other. For patients and their families, almost any condition that's serious enough to warrant hospitalization is a crisis. How everyone acts in that crisis is going to be remembered. It will be told and retold in stories like the one I've just told you, in stories like the ones that you're seeing in the digital storytelling that you've just heard from Dave. The bioethicist William May once quoted a woman who he talked to after her husband had died very suddenly and far too young. This woman said that the question she faced 
was whether she could rise to the occasion that her husband's death had confronted her with. The question of patient-centeredness for patients and families is whether the institution helps them as they struggle to rise to the occasion of the crisis they face, or whether the institution sets obstacles in their way, as we've already heard. Meanwhile, healthcare workers on their side of these events have to go back to work day after day. And however seriously people take their work, it has to take on the quality of being a routine. What a crisis is for patients has to be another day's work for the medical staff. I emphasize that to keep going back to work every day, healthcare workers have to limit what they can allow themselves to see. That limitation of perception became most evident to me in a story told me by a friend who was receiving radiotherapy as adjunctive treatment for breast cancer. By trade, she was a performance artist. And so she decided to turn all of this into a form of performance, a photo documentary of what happened to her throughout treatment. That included photos of her chest and the progressive burning that took place during radiation until by the end of treatment, the skin was bright red and raw. To the credit of the nurses in that radiology unit, they did look at the photos with her. What fascinates me and what I think has considerable implications for thinking about patient-centered care is that these experienced nurses reacted to these photos by saying they had never seen the burning of their patients before. After all the patients who they had taken through this therapy, they saw the side effects only when they looked at the photographs this patient had taken of herself. That's what I mean when I say healthcare workers can allow themselves to see only so much if they are to keep up the daily routine of their work. These nurses were not in denial about the pain the treatment caused their patients. I think a better description is to say they were in a state of suspended perception. Patient-centered care begins by reanimating the perception that's become suspended. It's about freeing people to be able to see what you're hearing in these digital stories, and you're going to hear it in the next one, they simply were not able to see, despite the family saying, look, there it is. And over and over again, the stories we're hearing today is about the healthcare workers just not being able to see what was going on. So we have two versions of patient-centered care that emerge in these stories. Setting the bar low, patient-centered care means safety. It means clear lines of responsibility with access to whomever is responsible at that time. It means the collaborative efficiency that the Price family underscores on their website, which I encourage you all to look at. Setting the bar high, Patient-centered care means what in my writing I've called generous care. It means recognizing the patient as a person with very individual fears and goals for their life. It means making that person feel welcome, what was satirized in Brian's wonderful tape. It means offering support to however that person seeks to rise to the occasion of his or her life. The low bar setting, I think most of us would agree, I hope most of us would agree, is the absolute responsibility 
the non-negotiable responsibility of a healthcare system. The high, bar the high bar setting is a possibility that is attainable. We'll hear more from Jim after I finish talking about the work at Dana-Farber to attain something closer to the high bar. My contention is that the low bar will be cleared only when the high bar is taken seriously as a goal, even if that goal can never be fully achieved. In the old days of the Calgary Health Region, which I know some of you remember, <laughs> I was lucky enough to serve on a committee to improve what we called in the title of our committee, patient experience. In some medical circles, it may be radical to take seriously that patients are not simply being treated. Patients are having experiences. And the quality of that experience is a genuine goal of medicine in excess of the success of the treatment. One of the most useful days that our committee spent was when we made site visits to a couple of hospitals in Oregon and Washington that we had been properly informed were setting a standard for patient-centered care. I had pretty much given up thinking that hospitals could be like the ones we found. What first impressed me in these hospitals was their quiet. There was no din of voices shouting to be heard over other voices that were shouting to be heard over loudspeaker announcements. Then I realized how uncluttered their hallways were. That moving from one area of the hospital to another was not an obstacle course, it was actually relaxing. It provided a moment when you could come down a little bit between what you were doing in those two places. The staff were continuously cooperative with each other. I remember one nurse we talked to saying that if her unit was busy, she didn't panic because she knew someone from another unit would come over and help her. And if they were a little slack, she would go to where a unit needed her help. Staff felt supported by each other, and they felt supported by the hospital administration. Much more could be said, but sufficient for now is the message that the hospitals we visited seem to be open places. An example of how physical spaces were open is that the plexiglass walls around the nursing stations had been taken down. There was just a desk. It was sitting there, accessible. But openness was also about information. This hospital practiced open charting, offering patients and their families full continuous access to all of the medical information. Obviously, much more needs to be said about how these changes had come about. They didn't happen overnight. In order to make these hospitals into the places we observed. My point for now is only that such places are not a fantasy. They actually exist. With these stories in mind, I turn to this new commitment to patient-centered care, sponsored by the O'Brien Center, and we hope fully embraced by Alberta Health Services. A story of my own hospital experience can serve as a cautionary tale of what to avoid in project or imagine. This story is about a half-baked attempt at being patient-centered and why, if you don't have time to ask Albertans to, quote, have their say about health care, it may be better not to do it at all. Exactly 21 years ago, I was having one of my annual follow-up examinations for signs of recurrence of cancer. This exam produced the most serious among the several false positive results I'd had over the years I was being followed. Initial x-rays showed nodes on my lungs and my diaphragm, and these were later confirmed by a CT scan. 
recurrence of cancer was strongly suspected, but I needed a mediastinoscopy to biopsy one of the nodes for confirmation. For those of you who are not medical, that's a scary surgery. It involves passing an inflexible tube through an incision here down behind the breastbone. Not a place you want to have investigated. Don't do it. <laughs> the day before this surgery, I went through a series of preoperative tests at Foothills. In one of these encounters, I was alone with a nurse who asked me several questions that were routine about my health, until her last question surprised me. She asked how my wife and I were dealing with the possibility that I might have cancer again. The truth is that we were doing very badly. Our daughter was not quite a year old. My wife was still recovering from extremely difficult pregnancy and delivery. And I was struggling to put back together an academic career that had been derailed by having cancer. What I had to decide very quickly was how much of that to tell to this nurse. In part because we were in a private setting that was actually appropriate for discussing such personal issues. In part because the nurse seemed like a mature and competent professional. And in part because I was feeling frighteningly alone and I needed somebody. I decided to tell her the truth. I said we were doing very badly and I waited to see how she would offer to help. She frowned, muttered something about how we needed to talk to each other more, and walked out of the room, leaving no space for me to respond. Then I felt truly alone. The obvious take home message of this story is that it's a bad idea to ask someone a question about their needs if you're not prepared to offer a serious response to whatever that person may tell you. And that message becomes magnified in proportion to how personal the question is and how much is expressed in the person's answer. The nurse's probably scripted question was somebody's idea of, gee, we ought to be patient-centered. Let's ask how they're doing. But the question was asked with no resources to actually back it up. As it was asked and then not acted upon, the question was nothing more than the hospital trying to demonstrate to itself how extensively it cared. A public event like today that invites and encourages talk about how care can be truly patient-centered and beyond today, the extended project that the O'Brien Center is undertaking should be dangerous because they arouse expectations. If those expectations are not met to some degree, if real visible changes do not occur in response to questions that are asked and invitations that are made to contribute, the public has every right to retreat into cynicism. Those who do tell you their stories can and should feel set up if Project Imagine proves to be only a public relations exercise, like that false dead-end pre-op question was to me. Asking Albertans what they want in their health care is especially dangerous because we can pretty well predict in advance what they want. People want to avoid having to go to emergency rooms because instead they want to be registered in a primary care practice that offers reliable after-hours responses, one of the points you've already heard from Dave Price. If they do go to an ER, they want to be seen quickly by a triage professional who can either give them an accurate time estimate of when they'll be seen or, if they don't need to be seen, as many don't, can give them a follow-up appointment on an outpatient basis. If people have to be admitted to the hospital, they want to be put in a room, not left lying in a corridor. 
and following a different pathway when a patient is referred to a specialist, something we've heard a lot about in Dave's presentation, the physician making that referral will be clear how long a waiting time is safe and will remain responsible for care until the patient is seen by that specialist. No primary care patient wants to be told, as Terry Price was in the story you just heard, that their physician faces an impenetrable subspecialist system and the best advice is to go camp out in the emergency room until somebody finally sees you. Take your sleeping bag and your chocolate bars and just wait. Nobody wants to see their physician be that powerless in the face of the system. And yet none of these conditions is met by current health care in Alberta. You don't need public consultation to know that these basic and eminently reasonable demands are what people want. You also don't need public consultation to develop a health care to-do list because you've already got the Flemings Report, which if you haven't read it is available online. It details the story you've already heard. It looks at the medical systems that need to be implemented to do what the Price family is recommending. Its recommendations are clear, reasoned, substantive, undeniably valuable, and they haven't been acted upon. The serious question we have to confront today is why, instead of taking the Flemings report seriously and getting to work on implementing its recommendations, we're asking people for more ideas. My best response to this non-rhetorical question is to quote a line spoken by the great actor, the late James Gandolfini, in what was sadly his last film, Enough Said. In the plot of the film, a woman with whom his character has enjoyed a developing romantic relationship has done something very unfortunate. She apologizes saying she just didn't know what to do. You knew what to do, Gandolfini says. You just didn't do it. That line could apply to the nurse who asked me how my wife and I were doing with the threat of imminent critical illness and then walked out of the room when I gave her the wrong answer. Either she knew what to do and didn't do it, or else she should have realized she had no business asking the question at all when she had no resources to follow it up. Far better if she had only said something like, this must be terribly difficult for you and your wife. I'm sorry. I hope somewhere you get the help you may need. That would have closed off her own responsibility, but it would have made me feel that she actually saw what was going on. It would have also, though, required an honest admission of the hospital's institutional limitations. And my observation over the years is that institutional medicine has a very serious problem admitting its limitations. That problem then often comes down on patients who think they can expect something the institution knows it can't deliver. How then can the Imagine Project not only know the right thing to do, but actually do some of the right things? I want to offer four principles that I hope will guide this admirable initiative. These principles are mutually supporting and they are overlapping. My first principle can be called responsible response. If public input is requested, then there needs to be ongoing public accountability of how Alberta Health Services is responding to what the public says. I suggest taking one idea a month from this public consultation exercise, one idea a month, and tracking its progress toward implementation. That tracking would make it clear 
if some particular group is blocking the progress of implementation. It would show the public exactly as possible at what barrier the implementation process has stalled. AHS almost never acts alone. It necessarily acts in cooperation with professional groups, government groups, and private groups. These groups might act differently if their cooperation or lack thereof was being publicized as the point at which some initiative had broken down. My second principle can be called small and specific demands. I worry when phrases like transformational change start being tossed around. In my view, the last transformational change in Western medicine was the Flexner Report 100 years ago. The history of medicine since is littered they occur just about every decade on a major basis, with well-intentioned initiatives that have generally produced very little results. They recycle the same issues and criticisms over and over again. My sense of the public mood is that generalized skepticism is one of generalized skepticism about the healthcare system as a whole, tempered by incurable optimism that somehow I or my loved ones will get the care that we need when we happen to need it, even though I know the system has all these troubles. People need to believe that. Many of the stories we've heard today testify to the limits of that individual optimism. The Alberta healthcare system is huge, it's disjointed, and it's wildly uneven in its capacities. Transforming the whole is not on any agenda that I can imagine. What I can imagine is starting with small, reasonably cheap, measurable improvements that because they are specific, require changes in attitude. Especially small changes require people to think less in terms of institutional convenience and instead orient toward respecting patients' time, respecting their fear and suffering, respecting their dignity. Open charting is a small change. It's not transformational, but it would mark a significant shift in attitude. And when a number of significant shifts in attitude aggregate, then the system begins to change substantially. So we have responsiveness and we have small and specific. My third principle is reciprocal benefit. I remember once lecturing on the usual kind of ideals I spout off on about doctor-patient relationships and what they could be. And a physician in the audience who's written some fine work that I admire said both ironically and, and also very sincerely because he practices medicine, don't ask me to do one more thing. Healthcare workers are already overloaded. That needs to be clearly recognized in whatever is advocated. One of the most evident features of the hospitals that the old CHR committee visited years ago was how relaxed the staff appeared to be. They not only seemed to take pride in their work, they actually looked like they took pleasure being in the hospital. Leadership, which is a crucial word that I've delayed too long bringing into this talk, leadership needs to show healthcare workers why these small specific changes will actually improve their working conditions and their job satisfaction. If people are expected to do more in the cause of being patient-centered, and very often they are, they not only need the resources to do what's required, they also need to understand and appreciate the benefit of that change. I'm thinking of the terrible story of the woman abandoned in her urine-soaked bed while in her report the nurses went off and had a birthday party 
And I'm asking myself, could they possibly have had a good time? Because they had to know in the back of their minds what else was going on. Or is, is this the dance band on the Titanic? I, I think too often what runs for medical workers down is, is that they, they know they're not doing the work that they want to do and could do. Medical staff need to, as I say, not only have the resources, they need to understand the benefits. They need to understand that a patient-centered institution is a better working environment for everyone. And that brings me directly to my final principle, which I have call Riser's Law because it follows a statement about medical education made by the physician and medical historian Stanley Riser. Riser was writing specifically about residency training, but he made an observation that I believe should organize medical work at all levels. Teachers, he said, should treat students as they wish them to treat patients. That applies to how everybody treats everybody else. To paraphrase a more famous me medical aphorism, the secret of the care of the patient is making staff at all levels feel valued and supported. And Dave has already talked about how Alberta Health Services has a very questionable record in that department. I say that because I can say these things today because the leadership has changed very recently. How this new leadership from the minister on down treats its employees will demonstrate how it expects those healthcare workers to treat their patients. Medicine is hierarchical. Things go downhill. Because I absolutely believe Riser was right. At any level of staff, no one treats the patients better than they themselves are being treated. Those staff who do heroically treat their patients better than they themselves feel treated end up burning out and leaving the system. And honestly, over the years, I have had so many conversations with people who were my hosts at events that invited me in, people who over several days I came to admire considerably as exemplars of what healthcare work should be. And then toward the end of my visit, always seems to happen when they're driving me back to the hotel at night, they'll say, you know, I'm really thinking of leaving medicine. I don't know if I can take it. You can't lose those people. You can't lose your best people to burnout and demoralization. And patient-centered care ultimately is about the best people on the staff side. It's not just about the patients. When Albertans have their say about health care on the Project Imagine website, there is a great deal that we can learn from the comments that are entered the conversation that ensues. But at the end of that learning process, the question will not be whether we have learned the right thing to do. The question will be whether there is the administrative leadership to do that right thing. Thank you.